Oh, there we go, an hour recording. And the coffee is finishing up its grind cycle. This, this will, that'll play over the little intro segment thing. Cool. And so, hello again, and welcome back to another Friday morning symposium. It has been uh, another week, I suppose. I track them by these now. So seven weeks since we started, which is kind of crazy. Uh, and we, we've kind of been moving around back and forth from different topics, you know, to keep it fresh and, you know, to keep ourselves interested and everyone interested, hopefully. Uh, last week, we, we followed up back. We did a couple weeks kind of in a row with one, I guess not in a row because we had one in between, but we did some on Zio Prelude and sort of looking at fun functional abstractions, very sort of, you know, general abstract, generally useful. useful. And before that, the first couple of sessions were on more building apps and building sort of front end and back end, full stack as it's called, applications. And I kind of wanted to get back to that uh, because I've been working on some stuff there and I want to share it with everybody and also then use that stuff I've been working on to build an application. And basically to just give everyone more examples of you know, what we think best practices are for building backends with Zio. There are definitely some, you know, there are lots of ways to do things in Scala. Uh, with Zio, it's a little more constrained in what I think is a good way, but even then there are potentially lots of things compile, lots of things will type check. Not all of them are necessarily uh, equal uh, in terms of just like ease of writing, ease of reading, flexibility. Uh, so we're gonna go over some of those techniques and also, hopefully show you how to build these full stack apps while simultaneously investigating like what is shitty about that process. And then hopefully using that shittiness to build a framework in which to subsume and evaporate and obviate and, and dissolve all the particles of, 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 of badness and pain. Uh, and so we only have the good stuff. Cool. All right, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. And I have too many windows open, so we'll go to, we'll go to an IntelliJ, or no, we'll go to here. We'll go here. So first I just wanted to make a new, not Z overflow, we might get back to that, but I'm just gonna make a new project. And I've showed this off a little bit previously, this, uh, this, this tool that I've been working on called Zio app, oh, which is also a, directory. So let me go to a different folder where it's not a directory so it doesn't get confused. There we go. Um, Cause yeah, that was the, the directory for the, the application itself. So if I type in Zio app, I get these commands. I, I did show this off once before, but I've, I've added to it and made it a little nicer. Uh, we're going to make ourselves a new Zio app and we're going to call it uh, worm for lack of a better name. And it did some stuff there and it gives us these nice directions that we should CD into Worm. And then we should, well, we can open it up in IntelliJ in the background. So we'll do that. There's some instructions here. Basically it tells you to run Zio app dev and then open localhost 3000, which we'll do. But after SBT has finished analyzing our structure here, Doodly-doo, indexing paused. There we go. I've been stressing my computer out lately. There we go, I found backend. All right. So we have this little backend here. I'm actually going to change this because I want to show it all from scratch. The uh, It sort of generates a bit of a example for us already here, but I don't want to spoil anything and just kind of walk through everything from scratch. So we're going to use, um, Zio HTTP, which we, we did use previously, um, to write ourselves a very simple router. So really this project structure right now is, is, is pretty simple. We have ourselves a backend file, which really just contains this backend server thing. And there's a config file, which isn't really being used. Then there is a front end file, which has our front end code, which we'll take a look at in a minute. And then this shared repository where we can put code that we want to use on both the front end and the back end. So it's a, it's a pretty basic uh, folder structure. 
there's not much here uh, except for all the boilerplate of sort of setting up an application with three different sub projects, one in Scala.js and, and some other things. So it's pretty minimal. So we're going to start by making an HTTP, HTTP app. And we're going to use uh, Zio's, uh, ZHTTP to do that. So I'm going to import all of ZHTTP. And there we go. And here there's something called collect. And we can collect requests. And what this means is we're basically going to give it a partial function going from a request to some kind of response. So it's the typical request, request response cycle of an HTTP app. So we're going to start by taking the, the method, which will be get. And then we can do the, the path that we want to match on. So I'll just say, hello. And then I will say some name. I can, I can match out the parameter there. And then I can have a response that's textual. And I can just put the name out there. So we're just going to respond with the name. Or rather, we could say, hello, name. Bang, 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 bang. OK, so now we can run this back end. I'm just going to run that in IntelliJ right now and not use my fancy tool just yet, because we're just taking a look at the basic structure real quick. OK, the server is running. There's the symposium link. We're going to go to localhost, localhost 8088, which doesn't have this URI, but it does have, what was it, hello, slash me? Hello, kit. There we go. Uh, and I've zoomed it out of existence. So there we go. Very simple server. Yes, that is HTTP, uh, Zio HTTP, which is a lovely library. It can do a whole lot more, but this is like the basic, most basic thing. We can collect requests and match them and send back custom responses. It is also Zio environment aware, which is kind of nice. So I can also uh, collect M here. And yes. And instead of this, I could just return a UIO response, which isn't that special, obviously. But what I could also do is use uh, sort of Zio services now. So now I could say zio.random.nextint, get myself an int, and then uh, map this. So I'm going to get some random integer. And then say, hello, kit. Your lucky number is this integer. And now what we get is a, an application that has a random in the environment, which will, of course, still work just fine because uh, you have the entire Z environment available to you when you're running uh, uh, a default Zio app. So now if I run this again and refresh, oh, and rather reload, and hopefully this kills the old process and doesn't throw an error. I might have to do a, a kill all if that doesn't work seems to have worked so far. There we go. So there's a very big lucky number. Uh, amazing. OK. Uh, so yeah, so you get the environment available to you, which is very nice. I mean, the, the, the syntax is kind of like HTTP for us, <laughs> very much so, except you don't have to deal with Clisely. You sort of get the, it's environmentally aware. It's error channel aware. It has the REA built into it, so you don't have to do some sort of weird hackery. And it's very easy to get started. You just do server start. Let me just import server directly. Just say server start, you give it a port, and uh, then you give it your, your application to run. And it'll just work. You could throw that directly in the Zio apps run thing. So that's pretty nice. Uh, obviously, we could have our own services if we wanted in here. And then we would just have to provide those uh, as, as layers. Um, maybe I could show an example of that. So I'm just going to have this foo service. And then we can make ourselves a uh, uh, a def magic number, and I will do a UIO of int. So this is how, this is kind of if uh, the the module pattern in Zio. So how do you make services with layers? How do you organize your applications? Uh, we, we're, we've been recommending this new pattern where you basically, if there's no pattern at all, you just do objects and implementations. So we're going to have this foo service trait, and then a foo service object, and inside of it we can make ourselves a live layer. Now, for trivial services, it's OK to probably just make a, a, a Z layer dot succeed and then just implement it directly in here. We could just say, you know, new foo, foo service and then just pick ourselves a random number out of a hat. But we're going to simulate uh, what to do in the more complicated case. So I'm going to make myself a foo service live, which I would like to depend on random. So I, I don't want to sort of, you know, call random in here. I want to abstract over that so I can have multiple implementations potentially or get more complicated. So I'm going to say, random.service, and this will extend foo service. 
and then we will implement the method. And now I can do basically the same thing, except uh, next thing, except I'm going to, uh, to make it even special, more special and more magical. I'm going to add the number one to uh, whatever my random number is, which might overflow, but that'll, that probably won't happen. I'd have to get very lucky or unlucky for that to happen. Uh, so now instead of it, now, now I have this, this live implementation, uh, which is a case class that takes the, it's, it's transitive dependencies as parameters and it's a case class. And then to make a live layer from it, I can just say foo service live dot two layer. And then I can constrain this to foo service. And then if I generate this type, we'll see that this will actually lift the properties into uh, the, the inputs for our layer. So now this is a layer that depends on the random service. And then I can delete this type description. I just wanted that. So it's constrained to foo service instead of doing a foo service live. Okay, so now we have an implementation. We have, this is basically the, the pattern. You have a trait that returns zeos that have no environmental dependency. They're, they're, they can throw errors perhaps, domain errors, but they're never. They're always gonna have any as their R parameter, which UIO does as well as URIO, as well as I could make this a task too if I want it to be failable um, with any throwable. And then in the companion object, you just have a layer definition. And a nice way of doing this is to make this case class that has its dependencies uh, this listed out as parameters, and then you can use them internally so that this layer bit determines how to grab those dependencies so they don't show up in the return value of, um, of these, these overridden methods so that you can swap out different versions of food service, one that depends on a random, another that depends on a database connection, another that just uh, pulls them out of its butt, etc. So now instead of doing uh, next int map, I'm going to actually want to get our magic number out of the foo service. So it would be great to do something like foo service uh, dot, uh, what is it, magic number. In order to do that, we'd obviously have to uh, define a method on, on this called magic number. And uh, the way you do that is there's a service with method. And then we can say with our foo service. And then we can do this magic number thing. And this is basically what we call an accessor in Zio, which is just a nice convenient method that really just delegates to some implementation. It just, it adds this environmental dependency here so that you can call it like it's just an object, sorry, just a, a method on an object, but all it's really going to do is, is add an environmental dependency and it's all that it's doing is pulling that out of the environment and then calling, delegating to whatever dependency you passed in there. So you can just decide at a later date how to actually uh, implement food service. You get to plug in a different implementation. And now if I regenerate the type, it now is correct. So now we're depending on a foo service. Now our app is no longer compiling because foo service is not a built-in Zio environment. And this is where we can use uh, Zio magic, which uh, is, is a nice thing to have. So if I do this and then try to rerun everything, it's going to tell us exactly what we're missing. And it says we're missing system service as well as foo service. We're missing system service because I'm using system to get a port number out of the environment in case I want to deploy this application. And we're obviously also missing uh, foo service. So I'm just going to say foo service dot live. And then I'm going to run it again. And it's going to tell us that we're obviously still missing system service. And then we're also missing random service for foo service. And because these both come with uh, Xeon, we can just switch this over to inject custom. And it's going to both provide the top level system as well as the transitive dependency to foo service using uh, the uh, allowing that to be delegated until afterwards. So that ZM is going to be provided by the default runtime that is provided with app environments. Now our app is running and now we can see that it's still working. And now obviously there's one added to our number. Uh, you can totally tell uh, that that's the case. Um, there were some questions about the two layer operator you used. And I know that, that that's a new feature that you added and it mm -hmm. does some fancy stuff. In the fact, this is a case class. So do you want to talk about that for a minute? That would be a great idea, yes. So it's not doing any macro stuff, even though I am addicted to macros lately. This, uh, this is a new feature I added. It is not using a macro. It is simply using an implicit conversion on, <laughs> on functions. Uh, so there are lots of overloads, but let's just take a look at a very simple one with uh, function two to layer syntax. So if self, this is using an implicit class. So it's basically an extension method on a function of two arguments to some return value. And so uh, it, it basically just takes all the arguments and then lifts them into uh, service dependencies. So it just goes through and for the first argument type, it gets an A and for the second argument types, it gets a B and then it calls it 
uh, with those arguments that it now plucked out of the environment, and then it calls two layer at the end. So it just lifts a function into a service definition, sort of in, you can write it this way, and this is totally fine, but it's, it's kind of a very common pattern if you have just a, 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 an implementation of a service that only depends on other transitive dependencies uh, of other services, uh, which is generally how you should write your code if possible. Uh, you can just put those as properties and then it just allows you to save yourself the boilerplate of writing this increasing, you know, it gets quite verbose potentially, um, which isn't very fun. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty basic translation. And the reason why it works just by looking like it's calling it on the object is because this is actually a Scala 2 feature. I think it's actually going away in Scala 3 where it's basically treating it like this the apply method on the uh, case class uh, and then calling it on that function. So if you if we were to just, just take a look at the build foo service thing and just say foo service live dot apply and, and ADA expand that into a function, we could see that it's, uh, oh, is that right? Yes, this is a function going from random service to foo service live. If I added an int here or something and then regenerated this type, we'll see that it's a now a function from a random service and an int to foo service live. Obviously, this type signature is now wrong because it's inferring that we need both random and an int. Uh, so that's how that works. Uh, it's kind of convenient, um, and you get to write it sort of very tersely, but it doesn't really do any magic besides implicit classes. There, there's one more question related to that about how IntelliJ handles this and how it's, I guess, the both the type inference as well as just the uh, the fan spinning as uh, it tries to figure this out? Uh, it seems to work very well for me, uh, pretty fast. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it recognizes that um, two layer exists pretty immediately. Uh, and it doesn't overwhelm me with all the different arities because it knows exactly the arity of this method. So you just see one two layer at any time, which is kind of nice uh, by having these different implicit methods. I haven't had any trouble with it. Um, and it's, you know, it's. I guess it's happens at compile time. These are all, I guess they are, they aren't, um, uh, they don't extend any val. I could probably rewrite it to extend any val. Um, you just can't have any vals inside of traits. So I'd have to have conversion functions and then it, it would work, but um, I'm not sure how much it would save. Um, generally, anyway, your layers are created at the outside of your app. Uh, anyway, that probably wasn't the question anyway. I'm, I'm prematurely uh, criticizing this implementation. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, generally it works quite, quite nicely. Uh, and now we can see uh, that it's actually doing because I've modded this random number by 10. Um, so we can see that it's now constrained. Oh, it's too bright within 10. Uh, any other questions? Uh, there, there's one question about automatic derivation of the accessors, but I told people we might uh, come back to that a little bit later, but that we were <laughs> working up to that. <laughs> Yes, so there, there, is a, there is an accessible macro that you can put on, uh, on in Scala 2. Uh, there was actually just a PR that went in to allow us for this new module pattern that doesn't have this nested, a nested service trait. The old way was involved this nested service trait that basically had these methods on it. We're not even going to worry about that. It was a little complicated, and we've kind of moved to just doing something more normal here. Um, but the accessible macros were not updated until just recently. So in 109, uh, that will exist. However, um, we, I don't want to do that right now uh, because the IntelliJ plugin also needs to get updated so that you can actually not get underlines uh, there because uh, it would look like that even if I use the accessible macro. It would compile, but IntelliJ would be confused. I've also opened a PR for something else, which I'm not sure is here. Do I have accessible in here? I think I made it. No, I did not make accessible. Um, somewhere I have accessible. Uh, let me actually open up this other project I have. Uh, Accessible. Let me let me copy this over. We can take a look at this. This is another PR I've made into shoot too many windows um, worm into Zio, and it's and it basically will allow you to uh, without macros, without boilerplates, write it like this. So it's not quite as nice as just dot chaining onto the companion object and getting the method, but you get to uh, it adds an apply method uh, if you you extend accessible of your traits. And then basically, it lets you call service width in a in a, in a way that has that parameter there hard coded. Um, so it makes it perhaps a little nicer to to write a lot of these. Um, 
I, I wouldn't recommend this if like you intend to do this everywhere or you're exposing something that's totally generic, but a lot of the times you only write it like this in, in sort of tests or at the high level of your application, and this is potentially acceptable. I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a solution for Scala 3 primarily where you do not have annotation macros. Uh, so this is probably the next best thing you can do beyond doing code gen or something. Um, and it's, you know, it's not my, it's not ideal, but it's, it's acceptable, acceptable, uh, accessible. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> but I will add back the manual version. Uh, the, the real thing about these accessors is that they're, they're pretty, you know, they're just kind of, they are kind of boilerplates. Um, but what they let you do is, is just delegate to an environmental dependency. So instead of doing something now, you're, it's, it's basically the Zeho equivalent of, you know, you're coding to an interface, not a concrete implementation. And then by making an accessor, you kind of have this nice high level uh, at the call site way of, of delegating to an implementation that's in the environment. So you don't actually have to sort of accept some trait as a parameter. You can deal with it at the top of your app or wherever you feel like providing the layer. In practice, it's like, yeah, this is what drew me to Zeo in the first place. I'm like, this is a, this is a I love the layer stuff. And, and the, the way it uh, just percolates at the type level, like I just, there was a type error. I hit alt enter, it regenerates type annotation and it worked. Uh, and that's just kind of how it, it, it happens, right? If I just do, you know, uh, zeo.random.nextint and then just, I'll just throw that away. Um, okay, I'm getting a type error, but I don't have to worry about that. I just regenerate the type annotation and now I don't have the type error anymore. Uh, really, really nice uh, to not have to sort of manually widen types and trawl through and, and add implicit parameters and things like that. Uh, I did not enjoy that experience of coding Scala before I used Zio and had to sort of do tagless finally type things where if you if you change the requirements, you have to then sort of, you can't just have the uh, IntelliJ automatically fix your code for you. Um, any other, have, I, have I built up more questions? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, think, uh, I think we're good. Okay, cool. Because yeah, this is only sort of a, a moose bouche appetizer. We haven't gotten to the cool stuff yet, but I did just kind of want to go through. Okay, this is what ZOHTP allows you to do. This is why it's nice. It's environmentally aware. You can use your high-level implementations, and then they can depend on other. You know, have a huge dependency graph. This could have a database connection in here. You wouldn't have to know about it here. You're just saying when I receive a method, get me a magic number. I don't care if you hit the database or whatever, you decide what that implementation is when you actually inject uh, the, the, the actual service itself. Uh, and then this macro will prompt you to supply its transitive dependencies until you've sort of fully built your dependency graph. Cool. But there's also a front end, of course. So let's actually get to the real uh, compilation cycle that's intended here. Um, so there's a front end. Front end, and I'm going to delete some stuff uh, so you don't even know what it's going to do. Um, and now let us take a look at actually running this. So I think everything is killed. I'm going to kill everything, but again, just in case. All right, nothing is left alive, I don't think. Uh, no matching processes found. That's what I'd like to see. Um, and now we're going to use the Zeo app as intended. So I'm going to say Zeo app dev. And what this is going to do is going to start up two file watching com compilers. Uh, backend restart. So every time I make a change to the backend, it'll both recompile and restart the server. And same with the front end, it'll every time I make a change, it'll recompile and re-emit uh, some front end code. And then there's also uh, a dev server running, uh, which will serve that front end code and similarly reload whenever a new uh, JS bundle is emitted. So every time I save the Scala code, it'll emit a JS bundle, and then this will reload the browser. So right now it looks like this. Uh, important website. Uh, very cool, very cool stuff. Uh, and if we throw this directly next to this, we can get sort of a sense of how that feedback loop is working. So I'll make this smaller. I will go to the front end and I can sort of say a dumb website. And then there we go, dumb website. Now I could revert that change and make it important again. So there's a there's a reload loop and it's it's pretty fast. Uh, you know, it's, it's maybe a few hundred milliseconds slower than it could be. Uh, 50 milliseconds slow or something, but it's, it's worth it <laughs> for the power of Scala. Um, it's pretty fast. So what is going on? Wh what do we want to do? Well, we'd like to hit our backend. <laughs> we have ourselves a backend and we haven't used it yet. 
uh, we would like to maybe hit this foo service thing and, and, and get our magic number and th throw that onto the front end. So how can we possibly do this? Well, it would be nice to, instead of sort of making some routes as we did here and say, oh, we have hello, and then we have to you know, use fetch to hit it, and then we'll have to serialize and deserialize, especially if we had another one that maybe had arguments. Let's not worry about any of that. Um, let's actually, uh, instead of doing that, let's take this foo service. And remember how I said we had this uh, shared folder. Let's go here and let's make a new class called uh, foo service. And let's plop foo service in here. So there we go. We have foo service in there. And now uh, hopefully everything is still, no, it's not quite compiling because the, the path has changed. So it's the same stuff, but it's uh, foo service. Just want to make sure it's still, it's all still compiling. Good. Uh, lovely. So now on the front end, we'd like to be able to call this. So let's go to the front end and let's make ourselves something called a client. So I'm going to say derive client and I'm going to generate one for our new foo service, which is now shared between this. And I have this little debug view, as you can see, which I can give it a name, magic number, and then I can give it a, a method. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to take this Zio effect, run it, and then just prepend it to some output variable. So it's just gonna, we're gonna list the output that we get from calling this method, which will be nothing right now, which is intended because we need routes for it. So how are we gonna make the routes? So we're going to say like, okay, so for, if you call magic number, then we're going to call foo service magic number, then return it. Uh, we could, but let's not even worry about this. Uh, let's, uh, let's delete this. And let's say uh, we wanna derive the routes for this. Actually, we can, we can even keep, uh, keep this one around and we can uh, derive the routes, gen for uh, foo service. And then we can join that with this other uh, router if we want to. Regenerates. Oh, response has actually, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't quite done that. Let me just do this. There we go. So we have this HTTP app that has a foo service again. So it's, it's very similar. Uh, and then we have a backend. And now is it running? Uh, I think it's compiled. I can't really tell. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so now on the front end, we can click this and we can get the number from our backend, which is, uh, which is kind of cool. And if we wanted to, we could prove that we're actually hitting this by, let's say, uh, calling, uh, this is a fun thing, import sys.process from Scala. Then we can say, say, uh, generating random number, and then just do a bang on there. I think a bang or a dot bang. Yes. And once this is done compiling, which maybe it's already done, I, it's, it happens pretty quickly, actually. We should be able to. Generating random number, generating random number, generating random number, generating number. Cool. Uh, so as you can see, it is not happening in the browser. The browser cannot say the word, uh, cannot say things at all. Only, only the operating system can, has the power to speak. And uh, yeah, so we have this sort of full stack communication. And all we had to do was derive uh, routes and derive uh, a client. And then we could basically call our service here like it just existed on the same code base. Uh, but obviously the implementation uh, lived in its own layer definition that lived on the back end that could you know, do lots of things, not just call say as fun as that is, it could also hit the database or do whatever. So you can kind of abstract over an entire service uh, just by making a trait and using these two little macro definitions. This all exists currently in, uh, in Zio app, Zio app. Zio app, yes. This exists currently in Zio app. If I go to build SPT, I'm currently using version 1.11. So that gives you the, the macros, even though uh, if you do Zio app uh, new, it'll create this app that has the right dependencies for you and, and can work. Um, it's very much prototypal. Uh, you know, it, it obviously doesn't take any configuration. So <laughs> how does it know what endpoint to hit? That's all kind of baked into this. Um, uh, using this, this, this Vite thing, it's, it's hitting uh, AP, any calls to slash API get sort of proxied to localhost 8088. So no configuration right now, but nonetheless, I think a pretty exciting potential, something I want to build upon and make more production ready, uh, make this entire suite of tools more production ready. Um, this, this feature was very much inspired by something called auto wire. 
Auto Wire, which is a library by Li Haoyi, who you've probably heard of if you write Scala. And it basically, you know, well, Auto Wire is a pair of macros that allows you to perform type safe reflection free RPC between Scala systems. So, yes, this is a way of performing uh, reflection free remote procedure calls from the front end to the back end. Unfortunately, I was actually never able to get this to compile. Um, it's, it's sort of not the most maintained thing. Uh, and it also sort of works with futures and you have to supply your own, it's very unopinionated. You supply your own server, you supply your own uh, remote, you know, how do you want to fetch from the, the server, which is cool. Um, but it also created a situation where I was actually never able to figure out how to hook it up together. It just kept, kept giving me weird errors. And so I decided to make my own. Uh, <laughs> And the macros involved are only like, you know, 100 lines of code for both uh, the front and the back end. Uh, so the client impl is, is this, uh, and the route simple is this. So if you're curious about macros, take a look. Happy to go into those at any time as well. Obviously, maybe not right now, but perhaps we could have a session on macros sometime if people are curious. Uh, but yeah, it's quite trivial to do, actually. Um, even though you know we need to add the ability to have configuration, uh, but this is very much like a call for if anyone wants to get involved in this. I think this this vision of sort of a really sort of the, whatever the rails with a, a Z at the end uh, <laughs> looks like in Scala, uh, I think is a pretty exciting you know space, and you could do things that you can't do in other <laughs> dynamically typed programming languages. So yeah, bringing the usability of those things, the tooling from dynamic typed uh, tool sets like Ruby on Rails, like Create React App, and then sort of not compromising <laughs> and, uh, and then adding all the power of you know, compile time derivation and, and type aware combinator libraries and, and things to make it a really pleasant experience. Uh, please reach out to me. I'm gonna try to make more issues and, and there's, some, there's a lot of things that can be done here to make it nice. Uh, but that's not necessarily what this session's about. I want to show that off. We can use that as sort of our uh, RPC format uh, for what we're going to build. But the idea is to actually start building a full stack app. So here's a bit of a, a skeleton structure that you can start with. Uh, but we would like to build a whole uh, application and to sort of walk through, OK, well, how do you set up a database? Uh, how do you do migrations? How do you query that database uh, in a way that interoperates with, obviously, Zio? Uh, and, and then how do you add authentication? Um, how do you make pretty animations? How do you do all this stuff? I don't have all the answers for all of it, but I've certainly explored a bit of it. And sort of the, the purpose of this is going to be to do that the best we can today and see what sucks about it and then fix what sucks about it. <laughs> and uh, I think more is good than sucks, but clearly there are going to be uh, sort of, you know, I've, I've written a bunch of full stack Scala applications in the past and, you know, slick leaves a lot to be desired. There's some very, glaring problems with all of the libraries that exist, like usability things that you run into almost immediately. Uh, but everyone sort of just solves in an ad hoc manner. And I haven't seen general solutions. Probably going to be pretty hard. I think, though, that the, the solution is to become more opinionated. <laughs> when you become opinionated and you say, uh, OK, well, auto wire, I can't get it to compile. But what if we just hard coded the routes to work with Zio HTTP. Well, then we can get that to work out of the box. You don't have to do anything. You just use Zio HTTP, and then you get some routes. And it's fully composable with other routes. You can derive routes for some other uh, trait as well that you make. Uh, trait bar service, uh, and and then bar service, and then uh, that'll work. And you can now we get this one that has, or will it work? Response has both of these things. I think I might need to take a look at uh, <laughs> how I've constructed that or maybe that is fine I'm not sure uh, what let's see what let me see what the uh, that, that 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 type signature looks strange but it might just be fine error during macro ex expansion empty left oh I think it's because I have no methods in here anyway clearly there is some 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 potential rough edges there I'm not sure about that I, I won't bore people going down that rabbit hole uh, but the point is if you get opinionated things become easier and uh, sometimes being maximally abstract uh, isn't necessarily the best thing, if, especially if you want to build a framework. So I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity there. Um, but OK, are there any questions? Then we can actually get into building the real app. Yeah, so, so a couple. So there was one about what the derive.gen does. 
Um, so I think you hit on that a little bit, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about the kind of service implementation, how that gets translated to uh, routes. And then there was also a question about how the serialization and deserialization gets done. Yeah, so the deserialization is all done with something, I'll start with that one, with something called Boo Pickle. So Boo Pickle is very nice. It's basically, uh, it's intended for being an RPC sort of serialization format when you have a closed front end, back end, full stack Scala system. So yeah, it says right here, good for mobile client server communication, bad for the public API for your service, great for data transfer over WebSocket binary, bad for data storage, uh, good for Scala to Scala communication, bad for Scala some other language communication. So it's basically custom built exactly for this purpose where it's, you can think of it like a JSON serialization, except you don't have to make implicit codecs or anything like that. It just will automatically do all deriving out of the box because there's nothing to really configure. It's, 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 there's one way of doing things and it basically will pack everything up into a, sort of a balance between you know, being very fast and very efficient with low memory usage. So it just basically packs all your case classes into a big uh, byte array and sealed trait. So it can basically transfer most sealed trait case class hierarchies into pack it into some byte array and then send that over the wire. So it's very fast, much faster than, than JSON, uh, which you know, don't really need if it's just this closed system. Um, obviously, if you want to use something like this to design like a, an open JSON API, it probably won't be the best for that. Um, I mean, you could, you could have different versions of the macros or, I mean, that's probably where something like maybe Zio web or Tapir is going to come into play where you have a more principled way of defining, you know, with a combinator library, these routes, because you're going to want to add documentation perhaps, uh, yeah, you're going to need a, a more, uh, structured uh, definition for your for your routes, possibly, but maybe there's something to also like derive, you know, Zio web endpoints or to peer web points from a, a trait by like, you know, we can annotate this with names and for like, what should the route be? Uh, what should the description of that route be? Um, cool. Uh, that would probably also work as well. Um, actually, maybe in a lot of cases. So uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I kind of just went with the simplest thing that worked for now. And I uh, just wanted to see like, okay, what are the, what are the needs of building real apps? I want to build, <laughs> build some real apps to get a sense of what the actual pain points are before prematurely optimizing one way or the other. I uh, hope that makes sense. Uh, in terms of the actual implementation of these, uh, so I kind of peeked into the macro implementation. Basically, it you know, obviously scans the methods, gets the types of the outputs and the inputs. And then it delegates to this, this well, for the front end, it delegates this fetch method, which basically uses STTP and uh, calls a, a route, which is API slash the name of the service stringified slash the name of the method stringified. And it posts as the body um, a byte buffer, which is basically the, uh, the, uh, the response, oh no, the uh, do, 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 do. STTP backend send request bytes from, by ah, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. It takes a, a byte buffer, which is going to be the pickled up arguments. So if, if your method has multiple, I haven't shown that yet, but that will work as well. Let me actually show that real quick. So process user. So we can even have like a, a user type or something. So I'm going to make a case class called the user with a name, string, and an int, int. And so we can make ourselves a user and this can return some kind of string. So now we have this uh, user function we need to define. Obviously it's kind of nice because now we're going to get a compilation error on the back end, and it's going to guide us to where to add this, uh, which is right here in our foo service live implementation. So let's do this. We'll make a new process user method and we will, we need to return a string. So we could just say user uh, dot well to string. Uh, and actually let's, let's do something. So we know it's actually done. We'll just say processed user. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna use that as our implementation, and now the front end can uh, call this method. So I'm going to say process user, and I could say process user, and I'll just make myself a new user because this is still in the shared protocol. I could say kit, and my int is is that number, whatever that means. So now here it is, and there we go, process kit. So it, it works already. Uh, it's kind of cool. Um, ooh. This is, this is a silly diversion, but it is fun. So let's let's actually, so I have this other library. I need to collect all this. Another potential of Scala Chance. I have this formula example thing. 
I'm going to go into here and just do some, you know, stack overflow, copy paste, copy pasta of my own code. And so here we have this, we're just going to ignore and just copy paste this for now. I have a YouTube video where I wrote this code in case anyone's curious. I'm going to make a class called formula in here. I'm just going to post this inside of it and move this to package formula, I guess. Is everything still happy? It might be. It still seems sad about that, but I think that's IntelliJ being confused. Um, is it? Let me see where I am actually. Where is this? Uh, did it? Where did, where did it put this? No, it did not move that. Move it. Move it. Moving trade formula to formula. Oh, oh, shit, shit, shit. Okay. <laughs> Never mind about putting that in a different package. Let me just make this example and then everything will be happy and I'll delete this other file. It's, it's moving things over one piece at a time and that was going to destroy everything. So I have this thing called derived form now, which guess what that's going to do? So I'm going to make a, an implicit val user form, derive form uh, gen uh, user. So the same type that we just made. And now I will at the top of the page do two things. I will first I'll make a user var, which is going to be a var, which has myself and has this number in here. One, two, three, four. No. Uh, now I have a user var, and now it would be great if we had a user form. So let's say a form dot render, and I'll pass in my user var, which requires an implicit user form, which is why we made that. And now hopefully, if this website reloads and doesn't explode, it'll probably, I think I did something wrong, let's see. Formula is not an enclosing class. Uh, oh, formula, formula, uh, delete all this. I don't need any privacy, no privacy. Are you happy? Yes. Okay. It's happening. Hey, oh, I got multiple user forms. Um, why would that have happened? <laughs> oh, because I put it in the debug view and out at the top. Okay. And I'm rendering that twice. That makes perfect sense. Uh, and I'll plop this all up top. So, okay. Well, hey, we have a form now, uh, which is kind of cool. And so now I can type into it. And the cool thing is using the magic of, of laminar vars. Let's just take a look. I'll say child.txt. Let me make this larger. Child.txt. I will pipe out the value of user var, get the signal of changes over time and map those to a string. So we can oops, underscore two strings so we can see them change over time. And so what's happening is there's this variable and we can change it and it's going to actually update this user. Uh, and, and down here, when we call process user, instead of doing this one, we can actually take our user var and get the current value out of it. So now the cool thing is we could say kit fun times, one, two, three, four, five. And then we can, uh, Call process user and it's going to use the one that we have a form for. So you can imagine the makings of an app here. We have forms, we process state on them, we send that state to the back end, and you can kind of do it in this nice RPC uh, style fashion where you could share the types between the front end and the back ends. They can have their own sort of special, you know, helper methods in a double number. Uh, uh, copying ourselves, getting our ints, and then multiplying that by 10 or something, right? Uh, and then our backend can use this method in its implementation, uh, calling double number on that. So when we process this, the number should now be twice as large, which would be great, an awesome feature. So let's see if it becomes 200. Oh, oh it became, I guess I multiplied it by 10 or something. Uh, <laughs> did I do that? What implementation did I just give to process user? Oh, I multiplied it by 10. Okay, I said multiply by two, but I did multiply by 10. So there it goes. Uh, if I have 55, I process user, now it's, uh, 550. So you can share your logic, share everything. Uh, I went down a rabbit hole, but that's a cool feature. Uh, there's, there's a lot of potential, I think, with Scala, uh, full stack Scala. You can derive everything, essentially. Make combinator libraries, then uh, wrap those combinator libraries with some macros to save you boilerplate in the common cases, and then sort of use them with reckless abandon to uh, vastly speed up development time. I mean, with Rails, you can use these sort of like, I don't know if anyone has used Rails before, but you can basically type like Rails, gen, scaffold, user, name, string, uh, age, int, whatever. And it will dump out for you like a, 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 a SQL migration. It'll create these controllers. It'll create these index.html files. And it's very cool because it's like, oh, right away, you can build yourself a blog. But it's totally like, you know, you're reckless, terrible, dynamic code at that point. I mean, some people enjoy that, but there's no type safety. It's kind of hard to edit at that point. You can get a lot done, but you basically can go from 
zero to legacy app in, in, in 10 minutes, um, which is unfortunate. Hopefully with something like this, you can still get that far, but then you'll be left with a principled combinator library that you can then use in a type safe way. Um, anyway, that's the idea. I, I'm sort of flitting around. Any other questions? Yeah, so there, there's a question about how you would handle errors in the network protocol here. So some of your methods are returning UIOs and what if it's just trying to send this across the wires? It's not, the server's not available or something's going wrong here. Yeah, I think it would just explode at this point. Um, <laughs> definitely, that would be possible. You just have to decide on some semantics for it. Uh, as long as the error is serializable, like if, this, if instead had an, an IO of something, uh, an IO of, of this or that, um, of a string or an int, or maybe a, a throwable that you could serialize in some way, um, do that. Uh, serialize it just as you did the, the results and then deal with that on the front end. Um, right now, it's very much just the simplest thing I could do, uh, which is just, I think if, it, if the server's down, it's just not going to ever return anything. Um, yeah, it's just going to sort of silently die potentially, or maybe throw an error in here. Um, nothing or just hang, I don't know. There's no timeouts involved. So it's a pretty minimal implementation, uh, but that's where features would need to get built. But I don't think in theory, anything is preventing it from doing more clever things. Uh, whatever needs to whatever needs to happen. You can also imagine adding us, uh, you know, what if one of these returned a stream? Uh, so that's something that's nice you could do and with a, a stream of results. Well, wouldn't it be cool if maybe that actually opened up a WebSocket connection and then piped, you know, uh, changes, get changes for this user, whatever that means. Um, and then when you call this, it actually opened up a WebSocket connection and then piped the changes over the wire in sort of an invisible way that you can then process with Laminar. So sort of the thing we did in the first couple of weeks with the, the WebSocket communication protocol, um, but basically being able to delete all of the boilerplate. There was a lot of protocol boilerplate. It wasn't the worst. and. It's, it's fine to do that, but it would certainly would be nicer if you could just get it for free um, by defining a, a trait method. It's like that's, everyone knows how to do this. It's all pretty easy. It's, it's, it's a very low barrier to entry. And I think if you can make it work in like 80% of the cases, that would be awesome. And then sometimes you might need to sort of shift over to do something else if it's really outside of the box. But I think the trick and sort of the, the thing that has kept functional programming from a lot of mainstream adoption is this impulse to always generalize and to, if you cannot take, like, if you cannot solve 100% of the cases, go nowhere, <laughs> like, which I think is hugely hampering. And you can get so far with functional programming if you're willing to compromise a little bit, which is being opinionated basically. Um, and yeah, I think it's almost like it's a superpower. It's, it's, it's screwed up. It's, it's almost like cheating. Like all, there's all this beautiful research and beautiful languages. Um, but there's no real framework for it because no one wants to be opinionated for some reason. <laughs> I love that about Rails. Uh, there's one way of doing things uh, and it's pretty dang good because they can optimize for that one way of doing things. Um, it's not necessarily lawful all the time. You can't maybe make a calculus out of it all the time, but you don't need one because you know what you're dealing with. You've, you've, you've nailed it down. You have an internal sort of semantics that you're familiar with. Um, which is its own form of, you know, creativity and art and, and engineering that's equally interesting. And thinking about the trade-offs there, I think that's super fascinating. Okay, I keep stay on stay on track. <laughs> I keep uh, uh, waxing poetically. Uh, so I'll wane it in, waxing and waning, if you will. And uh, are there any questions? <laughs> Uh, I, I think we've, we've covered most things. There, there was one question that we, we may come back to about using the service pattern with a little bit more complex structure where like um, you're using a database and or you're using a re user repo service and the user repo service is itself using a database and kind of how would you represent that with some of the techniques you showed at the beginning. Um, but depending on how far we go, we may we may get to that one way or another. Yeah, you know what? Maybe maybe we should just jump ahead because I, I kind of wanted to show sort of the, the basic building blocks. I think we can we can sort of move ahead to a more somewhat complete example. So let me close Worm. Goodbye, Worm. You were great. Let's go over to Z Overflow. Z Overflow. Do you get it? Z Overflow. Uh, and there's this other app, which is also a Zio app. So we'll start Zio app dev. And I will regenerate this page. And uh, 
this is what I posted. If anyone saw my little preview tweet thing, um, and this this has an example of 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 exactly what that person asked. So we could take a look at this. Uh, oops, where did the web browser go? So let me refresh this. Okay. So here we see a whole bunch of little things, which are these uh, issues. These are issues that have been scraped from Zio repos. So we have Zio schema, uh, you know, and you can sort of alphabetic, alphabetically sort all the method names. So there we go. <laughs> alphabetically sort all the, the method names of the companion object. That sounds like an awesome issue. Uh, and then if you click on them, you get the sometimes very verbose uh, markdown that's not formatted in any way. Um, and there's some animations here as well. Cool. Uh, implements, let's say test suite. So these are all the things that have tests somewhere in their text or the stringified version of everything, uh, which is kind of neat. What's something that we could search for that would like narrow it down? Uh, schema. Okay. Well, that's, oh, it's going to get all the Zio schema things. Anyway, uh, so this, this is a slightly more complete example. And we can take a look at this code. So let me switch over to. Zio, Z where'd it go? <laughs> Z overflow, Z overflow, and then I will open up idea. It's probably open already in some tabs somewhere. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Oh yeah, that's what I stole the accessible thing from. So this looks sort of similar uh, to what we just had, except here we have an issue service. So issues service has a single method on it, which is all issues. So we're just grabbing all the issues that we have in our database and piping it over to the front end because I've only scraped you know, the most recent ones. And obviously we could change that logic. But otherwise it's exactly the same, except for there are in more dependencies because issue service depends on, uh, the live implementation depends on an issue repository. And this, this is another service trait, which has its own uh, methods, one of which is all issues, which clearly the, the issue service uh, just delegates to um, with a minor transformation, I believe, into a list of issues, maybe. Uh, and then it can also save issues. Uh, so the implementation of this is down here. And we're using uh, Quill, which is hitting our database. Uh, we have a database set up. And then there's some little tests involved in that. So if I can just, uh, I think this will work. Am I using example issues anywhere? No, I'm not. So I'm going to delete example issues. And I can run this little test object here. I think it probably won't blow up. And we could put out all of the issues in our database with new lines between them. I'm speaking slowly while it compiles so no one notices. Perfect. Uh, so here we go. We should see all of the. <laughs> yeah, so it's clearly in one of the issues, someone just listed out a bunch of stuff. Because um, there's these large markdown blobs, it becomes hard to tell that these are all yes. Uh, case classes with an ID, a number, a title, and then <laughs> there's a new kid on the block, select a functor. <laughs> I don't know what that is. That sounds cool. Um, selective functor. What is what is the selective, selective functor? It's it kind functor. of a middle point between the applicative and a monad that kind of gives you some ability to branch out, but also gives the ability to introspect it. Um, I think our point of view is that with constrained uh, abstractions, uh, you can model the same thing, uh, but yeah. There's All right, a white paper here. So yes, white paper driven development. It's good to, good to use as a source of ideas. Absolutely. Um, but then to make them practical, generally, uh, is a nice thing to do. Um, OK, uh, that's awesome. That's funny. Uh, sweet. So anyway, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, so one thing, just like some general development tips, is it can be nice. Like I do this all the time. I like feedback loops. I think feedback loops are, are great for developing. Uh, I can't really code in the dark. I need to sort of see what my code is doing and have some tangible handle from it. That's why I like sort of live reloading development cycles. Um, but one way to get that, if it's just back end code, is to just, if you use IntelliJ, you can just make a little object. If it involves Zio code, you can extend app, make a run function, then just hit Control Shift R, and it'll just run that code and spit out the results here. So I 
Then you can just hit like control R after it does that once to just keep rerunning it wherever you are. So it's pretty nice. I, I do that all the time when I'm sort of testing some stuff. Uh, so here it's doing that same accessible trait to call all issues on the environment and then providing in the live issue repository. Um, so we can take a look actually at this. Um, I was thinking about doing this from scratch, but now that we built one layer, uh, sort of a dummy one, we can see that this, this, the pattern extends to more to less trivial versions. Um, so there, there are there are three definitions here. All save and uh, save again multiple times, um, and then there's a companion object which extends this new accessible trait thing. Just so I didn't have to write the the the, the macros, uh, whatever the, the the accessors manually or use the macros. Uh, and then I have a live layer definition. And we can see that this depends on, well, blocking. In the new, in, in Zio 2.0, these will no longer have stuff service chain to them. So it will look more consistent. But for now, blocking is a type alias of that. So we'll just use that here. Um, and this will so depend on blocking and a connection. And this is sort of what, what Quill requires. Um, so. To look at a very simple example, we can uh, just take a look at, well, saving is kind of interesting. Uh, there's some boilerplate here, definite, definitely, uh, going to think about how to maybe potentially address this. But what is cool is that uh, Quill is a macro-based SQL DSL, which can do some very cool things for you. For instance, uh, all I'm doing is saying query issue. An issue is just a case class. And the, not, none of this is actually has anything to do with Quill. I have this JSON hint here so that I can use the same case class to uh, uh, deserialize from the, the GitHub API. Um, but besides that, it's just a case class. So nothing in there is Quill specific, but it obviously has the power to introspect the structure as we've been doing. And then it, it makes assumptions, it's opinionated and it assumes that you have yourself an issue table. So I, I can use beta grip, which is, a, I guess I'm all sponsored by uh, whatever JetBrains products now, but I actually really do like DataCrypt. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm actually not sponsored by them, but... Uh, if, <laughs> but if they're offering, <laughs> please call us. <laughs> yeah, please, yeah, I'll uh, <laughs> give me a, like a, I want a jumpsuit. I want a, I want a spoiler on the back of my dining room chair. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here uh, we could take a look at uh, the table. So here, it's it's called issue. I have an issue table in my local database. We can look at the, the DDL for it. It's very simple. It's it's basically mirrors the case class. I had to do this manually. I created it uh, in data grip. You can like just make a new Postgres. No, oh, no, I don't want to make a new data source. I just want to make a new uh, table. So create a table, and then you can just give it a name like dummy. And then you can add fields and say if they're not null or if they're the primary key or what type they are. It's it's all right. Um, I think more ideally, one of the things on my to-do list for this is like that's repetitive. Uh, maybe it would be cool to automatically generate migrations for you uh, by just sort of feeding to some you know some method somewhere, maybe a list of case class types, and it can do that introspection and then generate it for you. Obviously, those things kind of fall apart in practice because you need migrations that do more interesting things. So that's it's an interesting problem to explore. I'm excited about exploring it because it's not fun to. It would be nice if that were automatic for you. That's something that Rails does as well, which would be cool to have. If Rails can do it, why can't we do it? Uh, why do we have to write the boilerplate ourselves? It's not fair. It's not fair. Um, but anyway, in order to get all of the issues, all I have to do is write query issue. And then I've got to wrap it in this quote structure, and, and that's because of its macro-based nature. It's, it's, it preserves the abstract syntax tree of your query. It's very, very cool, but from a user's perspective, um, there is a bit of boilerplate because I'd be sort of, in order to do a simple thing, like just query all of these, I need this, which is kind of my query, and then I need to call run on that, um, which uh, is, is all right. Um, but it starts to pay off when you have more queries and you compose them together because you can't abstract uh, the individual quoted uh, queries. Um, but it can get a little nested, especially for the simple case. It's just like this is the this is the important bit here, the query bit. Oops. Uh, but everything else is a bit boilerplate. So anyway, 
Uh, but it's all consistent and it's very cool. And I think it pays for itself. You can do some very cool things that Slick cannot do, uh, especially when dealing with um, nested monadic joins, uh, which is interesting. Um, actually, <laughs> has anyone had any experience with Slick doing a bunch of joins? Because it is, it's pretty hilarious what you end up having to write. Uh, you have to do this thing where if you have a four comprehension, can you even use a four comprehension? I don't think so. Uh, but you have some, some table, let's say it's issues, and you want to join it with some other table users. Uh, and you have to say like dot on where like the issue ID is equal to the user's issue ID or something, or, or the, the issue's user ID, I don't know. Um, but then if you keep doing this, you get this sort of increasingly nested case class where the next time you do it, you have to say like dot on, and then you have to case it ends up looking like this. You'd really just want to join the newest thing onto the last thing, but you have to sort of still percolate all of this information through. And it just ends up looking like these eight lines of increasingly nested tuples. And there's really no way around that. Uh, Quill solves that issue beautifully um, because it's all sort of a compile time macro. They could be a lot more clever about it and they let you use four comprehensions. I don't want to talk about that too much in the abstract, but if you've seen that problem with Slick, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're curious about the solution in Quill, we can talk about that. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, a more interesting query is this one, which is basically an upsert query. So I'm taking a, a chunk of issues and they have pretty good docs on their website. That's kind of what I've used. Um, if you want to uh, batch an operation, you have to use this lift query method. So everything happens inside of a quote, first of all. If you're ever dealing with an argument, you have to lift it in some way. Um, if you're dealing with a list of arguments, you do this thing. It's a, it's a strange pattern, but it's what you have to do. Uh, and I'm sure there are good reasons for it implementation-wise, where you, you take your iterable and you call lift query on it. It's kind of the definition of, of lift query. And then you call for each on that. And you get back an individual element, so an individual issue. And then you could just write a query as though it were a singleton query. So if you just wanted to write insert one, it would look like this. You'd sort of like lift a single issue. And then you could do whatever you wanted. But for, for batching multiple queries, you do this. Uh, and the cool thing is this on conflict update business. So if there's a conflict between two issues, say this were already inserted into the database, uh, one that had this ID, you can then define a series of, of sort of transformations, replace the old number with the new number, replace the old title with the old, new title, replace the old body with the new body. A little boilerplate there would be cool if they could just sort of wholesale replace it, but it probably needs to know not to do that for you know the ID and certain things. But these are things to keep in mind that this is a little painful um, and also kind of a, a semi-common case. But nonetheless, pretty easy upsert uh, logic at the end of the day. Um, and this all, this all works. Uh, I could show you where I'm actually using this. If I do it, uh, let me go to do, 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 uh, all issues. I think I have a, oh yeah, my GitHub thing. Yes, okay. So here as well is, okay, and I don't look good. I don't have my, <laughs> my, uh, my access token here anywhere, which is lovely. Um, so I, I here have another uh, trait, which is get issues from GitHub, given a, a user, or rather I think this should be called an owner in, in GitHub terminology, uh, and, a, and a repo. And I just put the live implementation inside of the object here, but there's no real reason to do one or the other, except maybe if, if your live implementation gets really big, you want to break that out potentially into another class or something. Uh, I'm using the same exact pattern here, uh, except this one depends on a config, which has my access token in it, because I don't want to just copy paste it into this file so everyone can see it and, and, and ruin my GitHubs, uh, which is what I probably would do for local development, but I have to, I'm forced to use best practices. Well, uh, by, by the nature of symposium. And then also there's an STTP backend for, for making web requests, which is a really nice library I found that has a, a Zio backend. Um, so that looks like this. Uh, there's this STTP backend that's parameterized over Zio's task. It's, it's general, so it, uh, you know, it has to take some high parameters. Um, perhaps Zio HTTP can have a, a com competitor that's more Zio focused. Um, so you don't have to uh, worry about that stuff. Um, but otherwise than that, you, I'm sending a request here to this repos, owner, repo, user, user issue, whatever, uh, get all the, the issues URL. Um, I'm sending the, adding the authorization token in GitHub's weird format. Um, and then I am taking the body 
parsing it to JSON. And if it fails, I'm just returning an empty chunk. I should probably throw an error, but this is mostly, I was just tested it until it worked. Uh, and it's, and then I die if anything blows up. Um, and so then down here is where I had, this is how I got all the issues. Uh, I am, I'm getting all of these EO libraries and uh, I'm getting, all, I'm for each of the repos. I am calling the GitHub API. I could probably even do like par and maybe so I don't get blown up. I can say only do three simultaneously or something. So they don't uh, get angry at me or whatever. I could also potentially introduce some kind of delays. This is an interesting thing. If we want to think about productionizing this in terms of, you know, doing this on a cron basis or, or repetitiously in production, that might be nice to think about if you have these types of batch jobs. Uh, Adam and I talked a little bit about that earlier. Maybe we can get into that. If there's curiousness there, there's a, there's a lot to expand upon. It was just turning into a bit of a tour. There's a, there's a lot to go over. And then uh, and then for each of the issues, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm flattening the chunk because each each time I call get issues, it returns a chunk of issues. So I'm getting a chunk of chunk back, which I then flatten and pass to save issues uh, in the issue repository. And this is how I populated my database. So maybe I could prove this by uh, what is a Zio library that I haven't yet copied everything from? Uh, Zio Keeper, what is issue? Zio Neo, Zio S3. Hmm. You probably do Zio ZMX. I don't think you've done that yet. Okay. Other other issues? Yes, there are 26 issues. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, even though I think it's going to be renamed soon, right? <laughs> it will be renamed soon, yes. Okay. But okay, as you can see, there is no ZOZMX, nothing up my sleeve, no ZOZMX. So if I add to this list uh, ZOZMX, it will um, add some new fields to our database, presumably if everything works. So let us take a look. I will just run this for now in lieu of having some kind of batch job, but it's also nice to do this if you know you just wanna you know, keep some objects around that you can run. Oh, everything exploded. Uh, GitHub access token, uh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I moved that. I moved my GitHub access token. I might need to, let's see, let's go to config. I don't want to, okay, no, there is a GitHub access token, but it needs to be in my environment. I might need to run this from the terminal instead, because here I have, I, I just set it as an end var, so I didn't accidentally share it. Um, so let's, let's run it from here. Uh, I can also have it in an application conf, but I didn't want to accidentally show that file because I actually want to show that anyway for other reasons. Um, so let's go here and let's run a backend slash run main. And then I can tab over to GitHub example or no process issues. Oh, I can't shift tab. Okay, process issues. Hopefully it works here. It looks like it's working. Okay, it says it worked. There's one way to find out. Hey, all right. So now we have all these issues. Do security audits. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, that 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 works. It's 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 kind of nice. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy this type of programming with C layers because I wanted to write some process issues. So I just okay, well. You can basically start it out by stubbing stuff. What if I had a method called get issues on GitHub? Um, that would be very cool. And then uh, also, uh, if I if that returned issues, I could then save them. <laughs> like it's it's pretty high level here. You get issues, you save them. That's kind of there's no there's nothing else in here that's really cluttering this up. No no other concerns uh, except for maybe parallelism. You've got to worry about that because you're at the end of the day you have to. Uh, parallelize uh, requests to an API. But beyond that, no, no mention of database connections or anything. It's down here that I can then use the live implementations of everything. And this, and this, the macro will, will prompt me to, uh, if, like, if I leave a couple of these off and I try to run it again, it's going to let me know that uh, I'm missing what I'm missing and for what. So I'm missing Java SQL connection for issue repository live and, and, and config for GitHub live. So, yeah, it's it's kind of a, a nice way for even just testing your code. And I think if I if you want to just sort of maybe with this new pattern and do something, I can now create a parameterless method, do something, and it'll create it in the right spots. So that's actually an advantage of this accessible macro thing because now it'll add the method to the right trait with the right type signature. 
Uh, so it might be an even nicer way to, I don't know. I like, I like doing this kind of aspirational coding where I just uh, type the signatures before I have the methods written so I could think at a high level and then worry about implementing them whenever that makes sense to and break apart large problems into small problems where they tend to not be too coupled. Um, sometimes you discover things in the course of implementation that cause you to rethink that, but uh, it generally works out pretty nicely. Um, okay. Uh, I will now take a pause for uh, uh, questions. So I think we have one question about Quill about uh, can the uh, column names be customized when you do these uh, these queries on like an issue? Yeah, there's a way to do there's a way to do that. Um, Quill Scala. <laughs> I'll go to. Well, I'll just figure out answers to your questions live. <laughs> yeah, yeah we can do it. No, there's uh, there's a there's very much a way, and I think I, I even remember the code. It used something called circles. So. Circles, circles, circles. Ah, here we go. So if you want to make your own schema that is uh, slightly customized, you can do this. So if you want to customize the name of the table, you, you say query schema, you put the type in there, then you can say the name of the table, and then you can remap individual columns. And then basically where I was using query schema, instead of saying, sorry, where I was using query issue, I would then use whatever name I gave it here as the as the schema. So it's not no longer just implicitly derived. Um, you can instead make your own. And obviously, as usual, we have to wrap it in, in, in the quote, uh, which is why this, this stuff pays off as, as your code becomes more complicated because you can, this allows you to abstract these queries and pass them around. Uh, documentation has a lot of good examples, um, but yeah, hopefully we can sort of make some Zio specific examples as well. Um, one bit of additional boilerplate that's worth noting in the issue repository is that and I mentioned this before, but when you make your modules, you want them all to have any as their environment. You don't want to add any constraints here because you might that that leaves you the freedom to implement a test version or multiple implementations uh, and, and and only decide via which layer you provide uh, how they're actually implemented, which is really a nice property to have. It's very cool, um, and so. What that means is when you actually implement it, you need to accept the arguments that you need instead of depending on methods. Occasionally, though, you are going to call methods that depend on something in their environment. So you can't just like if, if I just wanted to use uh, if I if I accepted clock here and I said clock.service, then I could use you know clock.now or something. And that that wouldn't have any um, unlike unlike the normal Zio where it depends on clock. If I if I depended on a, co a concrete clock service, it would have any there because it's basically implemented as this, as this recommended service pattern where internally it has any, uh, but the implementation clock live, if you, if you pass that in, you just get to use that without introducing other dependencies um, so that you, they can remain as UIOs. But in, in the case of Quill, run actually, well, it's all macro-based, but it adds a dependency, which is basically this Quill environment thing. It needs both a blocking service and a, uh, a connection in its environment. So if I were to not have this and I could write inject here, uh, just to use the, the macro to, to give me a hint. It's going to say, uh, yeah, you're missing uh, Java SQL connection and, and blocking service. But instead of actually using the layer, uh, the layer uh, creation here, there's, there's provide, which basically is a method that expects you to pass it in the environment. And so what that really is, is this has structure that has both of these things in it. That's what layers build you. It's going to, if I were to do inject, I could do this, Z layer dot succeed of my blocking plus plus Z layer dot succeed of connection. But layers involve some other powers uh, like the resourceful access. It's just going to add some unnecessary overhead. So what you can instead do is accept these as arguments and then just uh, bundle up the, the layer here using has all of to make the sort of the width together environment and then you can provide that directly. So this will not start up uh, or sorry, this will not build a layer. Uh, this won't do that resource management because you don't need it. It's already been handled ab above this by accepting these as as parameters here. Um, so it's kind of a pattern that can be nice when you run into this situation. It's not ideal. Generally, you should try to define your own services where um, well, you have a trait that you can call. With Quill, there is no, ideally it would look like this. There'd be some you know, Quill context that we can call, and this, this would just have a run on it, Quill context. 
And this would have no dependencies because basically that would have its own layer to create it that would accept those at creation time. And so you're just getting an implementation. But sometimes you're going to run into the situation where, uh, for whatever reasons, I think Quill, in this case, maybe it's possible to change that. I'm definitely going to see if there's ways to make it nicer for Zio. But I know that you know it's a very general macro-based library that has many implementations. So it's there's probably a good reason why that hasn't been done yet. Um, though I, I'm, I'm curious if it's possible. And I'm excited to explore that because that'll make the ergonomics a little nicer, uh, just one stage nicer to do to do that. Um, and then perhaps you know maybe you could instead also make a specialized version when you just want to run a query immediately or something. Uh, but that's a lot of that's a lot of work. Sometimes it takes a lot of work though on the library uh, author's part to make like the most prettiest API. Uh, <laughs> just explore the Zio code base. Sometimes there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of painful to write code, but it it, it uh, ends up with nice nice to use at the call site. Ends up being nice to use the call site. Okay, I'm out of my uh, my ramble hole. Uh, what else we got? <laughs> uh, so there was just one question about this connection. Uh, so if we have multiple queries we're running, does that mean they all use the same connection? That's a great question. And uh, let's go back to the Google Docs. I don't think so. I think I think there's a Hakari connection pool involved. Uh, I'm not sure if connection is clever enough to abstract over that. Maybe the Hakari connection pool exposes this interface and therefore gives you different connections. I think that might be how it works, but I'd have to read the, doc, the docs and I could check in with Alex about that. Um, I know I know there's like support for transactionality as well for uh, this stuff that you can just basically wrap something in a transaction and it's all going to be nice and zeoified. Maybe it works just like that. Okay, batch insert, not quite. Uh, you wrap it around something, um, but I haven't explored that yet. As we build on on this project potentially, or or shift gears into a, a different sort of full stack project, or build multiple full stack projects as we iterate on our tool set here to get as most as much evidence and experience as possible, we'll we'll be able to sort of work through those questions and problems. But that's definitely something on my mind. Yeah, how do you do transactions? Is this fast? Is it usable? Um, I think in order though of my priorities is like, is it as maximally wonderful to use as a user as possible? And then worry about uh, performance uh, next. Not saying performance is not important, but just thinking in terms of, uh, you can always drop down to a lower, lower level in the cases that you need to. Um, Scala is a pretty fast language all told. And just when you look at the popularity of things like Rails, like Ruby is, Ruby is one of the slowest languages you could possibly imagine. But it's incredibly popular and powers lots of websites um, because it's so easy to get started with. Um, it's not quite easy to maintain, but just even the power of being easy to get started with has has uh, really given it a lot of, uh, of, of popularity and, and power. And so I think, yeah, my, my first focus is just ergonomics and making things nice and easy, uh, obviously with the mind towards compositionality and, and speed. And I think all of that is generally possible using functional uh, paradigms, but um, yeah, we'll definitely explore it. Any others? I think that may be uh, it. Okay, okay. So yeah, I, I would love some feedback too, because like I wasn't sure if I should code all of this live. I kind of got carried away with proving it out. So I didn't like literally type this in front of you. It's a bit of a balance because this hour and a half always goes by way too quickly. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to show off more, but it's a tension between like, I'm sure people like seeing it sort of being worked through. Uh, I think people like that about the, the Zio schema session we did where we didn't know what we were doing and we kind of made some mistakes and hacked through it. Um, I think that shows off a lot that just talking about something after the fact doesn't. So I'd be curious what you think the balance of that should be if anyone has any opinions. Um, but perhaps, you know, we could like, I don't know, I know Ash asked if we could just live stream as we code. So maybe maybe we could just, you know, more, uh, more random, less structured stuff as we just work through stuff. So, you know, Twitch, right? Uh, um, stuff like that. Uh, that could be fun. I have no idea how to set that up. If anyone knows how to set that up, let me know. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of where it stands now. I think we kind of went through everything except for, of course, the front end uh, on this version, which is pretty minimal. I'm not even using this debug view anymore. Um, we could take a look at that, I think, and that would kind of wrap it up. So 
we have a, an issue service that we're driving the client from, uh, which we're using to get all issues. And then I, I was working on for Laminar, a, uh, a very basic Zio interop library. So Laminar works with these things called event streams and signals. We need to change, take our UIO and run it to an event stream so that we can then plug it into uh, uh, one of their reactive variables, variables. And so to do that, I have this UIO, I call two event stream on it, and then that gets me back a list. So I turn it into a chunk. I was mucking with performance. I wasn't, that probably isn't necessary here. Um, and then I, I bind the result of that uh, event stream into this variable. So basically what's going to happen is when this div first loads, it's going to call this API and then assign to this variable all the issues. And then those issues are going to uh, be used. The signal out of those changes uh, are going to be combined with this query variable and then I'm debouncing uh, as you're typing, which turned out not to be necessary, actually, I don't think. Um, and then uh, if the uh, query variable is empty, I just take the first 10 issues. Otherwise, I filter all the issues with the string. This could probably be optimized to be faster, or pre-processed, or using tries or something uh, uh, in JavaScript. But what this is, is now getting me is a signal of a chunk of issues. So it's basically the same type as you would get from all of the issues, the, uh, from the issue uh, var, except it is filtered, which is nice because then this can get piped into a list of these issue view things. So this split transition is, I have this animation library, which I've also talked about here, um, but that allows these to sort of animate in and out uh, nicely, potentially nicely. Um, so that's why they all kind of snap in and out of place is because what I'm doing is I'm saying these issues have a key and that sort of gives these, these divs an identity. So it's just not gonna wipe out the, the DOM every time. Um, and that's going to be the issues ID, which is its unique identifier. And then we get this callback that gives, has a couple of options. We get a key, uh, which is going to be that ID. We get an individual issue, which is its first value. But the cool thing is because this is a reactive system and because the filtered issues are changing, um, if say on the back end. Uh, we updated in a batch process our issues and the ID stayed the same, but say the title changed or the body changed, it would then map those same changes to this uh, now signal of that issue. So it's probably not going to happen right now. So I could just use this variable of being the first issue that we get, but I want to sort of leave it open to that. And then that's kind of what the, the that comes with Laminar, this split thing. But I added this other variance that has this sort of animation property, the split transition. And what this does is it gives you some abilities like to say uh, the height, as well as in the simple version, this would look exactly the same. I can, I can animate basically the height and the opacity. So this is going, by just doing that, it's going to uh, change the height and the opacity. So we could say, if I change this to width, this is going to look strange because it's not meant to animate this way. Mm. Um, but we can at least take a look that now they're all sort of animating in this strange width way, and it's it's not looking very good at all uh, because it's it's yeah it's, it's very strange. Um, but it, it adds the ability to sort of animate in and out based on whether or not they're in this value. So when when it when it when a when an issue disappears because it's been filtered out, it will then animate out height and opacity wise, um, and this height dynamic allows it to then also expand. Uh, when you expand it like this. Um, otherwise, it would just hard code the height. There are probably you know, better ways of doing this. It's just sort of pack together a bunch of libraries. Uh, this one is called Animus, if you want to check that out. Um, it's a spring animation library for, for, for uh, Laminar. And I need better docs for it. Um, but other than that, it's just basically some divs and some inline styles, and then mapping out uh, like the, the current project uh, into the child text and, and things like that, um, and mapping out the title into a child text. And that's because this is a reactive uh, signal of issues, uh, which might change the title. So that would just update the title element um, here. That's the project title issue, et cetera. So just some inline styles. Uh, you could abstract these if it gets more complicated. But this, is, uh, this renders a single div for a signal, sig single signal of issues. And then this is what takes a chunk and splits them by rendering a different one per issue. Uh, and then that's basically all it is. It gets the issues from the back end, assigns them to a var. As you type in this input, it updates this query var 
It's this controlled input where the, the variable will set the value of the, uh, the input, but vice versa, um, the input will update the, 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 the variable. So there, it's this bidirectional binding that changes filtered issues. It's this sort of FRP network uh, graph thing that keeps everything in sync and is very nice and functional. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of it right now. I'm not, I'm not using this right now, but I um, don't need that. Very nice. But yeah, okay, that's a, that's a bit of a full stack exploration. Um, it would be great to actually, maybe next time, really start from scratch or really extend and type some more code, but there's a lot to go over. Um, if anyone is, I've mentioned this before, but if anyone's willing to get involved, I think there's a ton of things we could work on if you're excited about the potential of a full stack sort of Rails-like solution, whatever that might look like. Um, obviously a part of it is this sort of dev server thing. Uh, I sort of mentioned that I built sort of like a TUI library for this. That could be abstracted into its own thing. It's a little buggy, at least at the top of the screen. I don't know why that's, there we go. Um, you can kind of focus the back of the front end or quit and it kills everything. Uh, though I'm thinking for the next step actually would be screw terminal UIs, they're annoying. <laughs> There's only so much you could do with it. Why not have a web app and serve a web app. So you, you click Zio app dev and it will just open up a browser tab that uh, shows you the output of the front and back ends, but you can also use to, you know, create new projects potentially if you're not in one currently or generate uh, schemas, run migrations, sort of see a full st status of your app, hook into Zio metrics when that happens, uh, sort of have like a one-stop shop for building an app. I, I even, you know, even Rails doesn't have that. They just have some Pretty, uh, it doesn't even handle front end, well, it does, but through static HTML generation, not through a, a single page app sort of interface. Um, so I think there's a lot of cool stuff that can be done there and certainly a lot of like parallelizable issues for different aspects of that uh, project. So if anyone would like to get involved and either pair with me on this stuff or uh, sort of just work together, maybe we can make an official Zio top level, uh, Zio Discord, Zio app um, community project thing. That would be fun. I'm, I'm very excited about continuing to explore this. And, and uh, I think there's a lot to learn about Zio here. And, and also, I don't know, everything. <laughs> there's a lot involved. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's everything. It's, tw it's 1230. We made it an hour and a half. Any, any yeah. final, uh, thoughts, questions? Um, I think there were a couple of uh, people who were interested in links to the various, uh, libraries you're working on here as you as we build the front end empire. So uh, maybe you can post those afterwards. Yes, I will. Uh, obviously, Zio app is here. Uh, I will post this. I will post um, uh, Animus was the front end library. I think those are the two big ones um, that I had currently. Magic is the sort of the layer and graph thing that I was using, but that's going to be part of Zio for Zio 2.0. Ooh, what's Toysio? I don't even know. I forgot I made this. <laughs> Someone forked it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yes, that's 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 great. And and oh, uh, someone in the QA or in the um, in the uh, Zoom chat asked about. Uh, I want to start contributing to Zio. Could you advise me where to start? I already have Scala Oculus experience, but not much of functional programming. Um, well, I think I'd recommend with like, what are you most interested in? Uh, I, I definitely was in the same situation for a long time where I wanted to contribute, but I didn't know where. And like, it's, yeah, it's great if you want to like peruse the issues and just see if there's one that makes sense to you, but also that can be kind of boring and you can kind of get to the thing where if that feels like a chore to you, don't do it. If you're not excited about it, don't do that. I mean, it'd be great if you did, but I think even better would be if you found something that was missing in Zio that you really wished existed or just some project that you're interested in expanding or seeing to completion and then either just reaching out to someone who's involved like myself or Adam are probably safe to go to or posting on the discord and um, and just building something. That's kind of how I first started was I did that Zeo magic thing. I'm like, this is, a, this is something that I want. I'll just do it as a separate library. And then, oh, now it's gonna be involved uh, in, in Zeo too, which is great uh, because people are open to that. Um, and I also then also joined Zyverge. So it's, it's worked out great for me. I'm glad I did that. Um, but I think, you know, don't, don't worry about solving random issues or like, you know, doing 
little cleanups or typo fixes, that's great and all, but I think finding something you really care about and see as a, as a weakness um, is probably the best way to get started. But if you just want to like pair with people and, and just sort of, you know, I'm happy if, if anyone wants to pair with me and just like watch me as I work or work with me and, and try to learn. I'll, I like talking, <laughs> obviously, um, as, as I do stuff and then parallelize and we can do that if you, if you have less uh, of, of an idea right away, what you're, you're super interested in. If it's just like, I just want to contribute and I don't care. Well then just, just reach out and so let's, let's pair. Yeah, I, I think the other thing there is like try to find a library, like even if you don't have like all oh, of this specific thing, like find a library as an area you're interested in. Like if you're interested in like SQL and database stuff, like do something with ZeoSQL because then maybe you will start out with kind of the like just pick up an issue, but then you can kind of build from there as there's active development. Um, if there's kind of a lot of stuff going on with that library. Um, versus just, I mean, if you want to kind of pick off this here, this here and there, that, that's great. But I think sometimes you can learn the most if you can kind of either in one shot or over time kind of build up to say like, hey, this feature, like I'm really dry. Yeah. And I mean, and selfishly, I think that's how you feel like you're involved and invested and you want to have ownership and, and you don't just want to like, oh, I just fixed a couple like typos. That's awesome. And I appreciate that. But I think I know I derive satisfaction from feeling like people are happy about what I did. And then it's a lot of stuff and it feels important and cool, right? Just silly, uh, whatever, human ego stuff, I guess. It, it feels good to help other people, but it also feels good to be appreciated. Um, and then you'll just drive further motivation. Now I find myself fixing issues in Zio because now I feel like ownership over the product, over the product, over like the whole thing. Um, I feel invested in it. I want it to all be shiny. Um, so I'll, now I have more motivation to do even the, the more uh, potentially boring sort of bug fixy stuff because I think Zio is awesome and I want it to succeed. Um, so selfishly, if you get involved and feel ownership and feel happy, then you'll feel the same way I did. And then you'll, feel, then you'll actually be motivated to do the silly typo fixes that I maybe don't want to do. Um, but you'll feel good about it as I do. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, I think that's that's all the quest. Wait, another chat. Bye, thanks. Bye, thanks. Okay, bye, thanks, everybody. Um, Thank you so much, week. everyone. Please give feedback if you want us to talk about specific things. And uh, mwah. bonsoir. Bye. bye.